way. Um, we've got 140,000 miles of rights of way across England and Wales, um, which would get you halfway to the moon if you put them all together. Um, and they're made up of footpaths, which you can uh, walk on, bridleways, which you can walk, cycle or ride a horse on, and restricted byways, which you can uh, do all of the above, plus ride a horse and cart down if, um, if you so wish. Um, and these rights of way, I'm sure uh, if anyone's seen an ordnance survey map, they would have seen the, the rights of way across, across the ordnance survey map marked in, in green. Um, and that data comes from uh, local councils, because local councils are all required to have a map of all lost rights of way in their area. And that's called the definitive map. And slightly confusingly, there, that means there's about 140 odd definitive maps across England and Wales. And obviously those rights away are really important for the ramblers and really important for anyone who wants to access our towns and countryside um, on foot or, or on a bike or on a horse. So if we can just um, go on to the next slide. So as I said, we've got an amazing network of public rights of way in England and Wales, but we know that for the ramblers and, and wider that there are thousands of miles missing from those maps. Um, when the maps were originally, when the definitive maps were drawn up originally in the 50s and 60s, things were missed off. Accidental things were missed off or in, maybe in some cases on purpose things were missed off and certain landowners didn't want public rights of way on their land. Um, and Sorry, I was muted for a second there. Um, at, the, um, at the Ramblers, uh, we, um, we've got the Don't Use Your Way project, which is looking at putting historical rights of way back on the map. And those historical rights of way are all across England and Wales. And they're, sometimes they go back centuries and you know, they were used by people to go to uh, market, go to where they worked, go to the pub, go to church. And um, in uh, the year 2000, the Countryside and Rights of Way Act was brought in. And essentially that says um, that there is a deadline for putting those historical rights of way back on the definitive map and making sure they're recorded on the definitive map. So we've got just uh, as of today, uh, so that deadline is the 1st of January, 2026. And as of today, that is five years, six months and 15 days to find historical rights of way across England and Wales and make sure they're recorded. So if we can look at the next slide, the process of, of actually recording those rights of way is actually, is basically about collecting evidence that a particular route was there at some point in the past and that the public used it in the past. And there's a legal mantra that it's once a highway, always a highway. So if you can prove there was a right of way in the past, and it hasn't been legally stopped up, then um, it should be on the definitive map now and it should be open and accessible um, to the public. And to do that, volunteers collect evidence, uh, mainly historic map evidence um, and, and other things as well. There's been paintings used or people's diaries to show those particular public rights of way. Um, and we can use that evidence going back uh, to the 6th of July, 1189. Uh, that is the date of um, the accession to the throne of Richard the Lionheart, Richard the First, whose picture you can see there. And because in e English law, mm -hmm. that's the definition of time immemorial. And then that evidence is collected and submitted to local authorities. And it's basically a member of the public saying the definitive map is wrong, the definitive map doesn't record everything, and I want to make a, an application to, to modify the map to add a right of way to it. If we can just go on to the next slide. So obviously we've just over, we're five and a half years left to find all these rights of way. Um, you know, we, we, there are several challenges that we face as an organisation, as a charity, to get these rights, rights of way back on the map. The first of which is, where are they all? They're, you know, we, we think they're rights of way across England and Wales, probably in every parish, in every community, there'll be footpaths or bridleways that are missing from the map. Um, then there's also, you know, this, this whole process is quasi-judicial. It, it involves skills in interpreting historical maps, in putting together an argument, 
Um, so, you know, it, it can be quite a high barrier for volunteers to get involved with this, with this work of claiming lost rights of way. And then there's also a broader issue for us as a charity, which is understanding the extent of the issue. So how many are there across England and Wales that are missing from the map? And where are they so we can actually prioritise locally and nationally? You know, if we know there's twice as many lost rights of way in Cornwall as opposed to Derbyshire, that means that we can put more resources into Cornwall to make sure that those paths are put back on the map. So as an organisation, we thought about what the best way of addressing some of those challenges are. And we came up with the idea of doing a, a crowdsourcing exercise to find those lost rights of way, get the public involved in scouring historical maps to, to look for, for those missing rights of way. And we wanted to put that at, at the heart of a public facing campaign because you know we want to create a movement of people that want to reclaim their rights of way. And so we worked with Aston to develop a system to do that. And um, I think Dan is now going to demo that for you. Thanks, Jack. Um, so hopefully everybody can, can hear me. So uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to just um, take you through uh, the platform from a kind of user perspective. And then I'm going to hand over to Matt. Um, he's going to explain a little bit um, about the kind of technology uh, under the bonnet. So just going to so the uh, Don't Use Your Way tool is available um, or promoted on the Roundup site and through various um, kind of media channels uh, and was really available to anyone, um, in any member of the public who wanted to kind of join the campaign. And uh, when they did, they'd come to this page first of all to, to join the search and they'd get a couple of options, um, getting a, a random area or uh, searching a, a, on the map. So, um, so I've just searched the random area, um, and, and what this has done is presented me with a one kilometre um, grid square of uh, what you can see there as, as OS mapping. Uh, and the idea uh, was that the, the country was divided up into 150,000 of these squares, and the idea would be that each volunteer would go in and, and would review uh, one or, or more of those squares, or any number of those squares really, to see uh, what lost rights of way they could, they could spot on the map. Um, so I'm kind of skipping through some of these squares um, and uh, I can then sort of, once I've found one that I'm interested in, uh, review, I can click on the view button um, and it takes me into to the tool. Um, now, doing something with completely random areas of the country isn't great for a demo, so I'm going to say cheat at this point and go to uh, go to one prepared earlier. Um, I found a candidate um, for demonstrating earlier. Um, and when uh, the users would first uh, access the tool, they'd be uh, presented with a set of instructions. And these instructions are, are telling them a little bit about the program and what it is they should actually be doing uh, in terms of using the tool to identify these lost rights of way. So I'll just quickly skip through those there. I'm not going to read them out, but I will explain to you what those instructions say. Um, there's also a little help tool which uh, gives you some idea of how, how to use the tool. So essentially, the instructions uh, explain that there's uh, Historic mapping and contemporary mapping. And you can see I've got a split screen here with uh, historic mapping on the right hand side and contemporary mapping on the left hand side. Uh, and there's a slider bar at the top that allows us to uh, between the two. So these are the same geographical area. And as you can see, as I uh, pan from left to right, it's moving me from contemporary mapping to historic mapping. And that historic mapping is ordnance survey mapping from about the 1880s. Uh, and I'm in a, an area of Warwickshire, just off uh, something called the Foss Way, which is a, a Roman road. As little known, felt that the Romans were big advocates of free and open source software and, and named their roads after it. Uh, this one goes from Exeter up to Lincoln, uh, I believe. So, uh, so there's the Roman road on the historic map. Um, you'll see the uh, current footpaths on here in green. Uh, and on the historic map, uh, you, there are little FP symbols. Um, and we created a, a vector layer of all of those FP symbols. They were crowdsourced in another project. And the same we're trying to do is get the users to play, in essence, a game of spot the difference. So where are there these symbols on the map and, and, and the path zone um, where there are uh, no bars um, today? Uh, and you can probably spot a number of those as I pan between the left and right. And then essentially what we wanted the users to do is to uh, digitize these routes. Uh, so there is a path, you might not quite be able to see, but that 
FP symbol where I just started this track um, is the label for a path that comes to the right along the edge here of um, Compton Bulls. And as you can see, I've just digitized that particular route. So there's a few more on here, so I might just do a, a couple more just to, to show this for. Um, I'm not digitizing them. The main point really was identifying them so that they can be used for research. But you can see, you know, within a couple of seconds, you know, I, I can actually capture the underlying map um, with the footballs that aren't missing. Um, what I'm not doing is, is recapturing the ones that are on the contemporary map. Um, so you can digitize the path down here. Uh, I'm stopping at the point at which the, uh, that it joins the contemporary footpath and I'm leaving that. I'm also just for the purposes of, of, of demo, just going to put uh, a mistake path in at the top, which um, we'll come back to a little later. Um, so that's essentially the idea. <laughs> and people go in and, and um, uh, review the two, play this game, spot the difference. There's also actually um, another map layer as well, which is used at a different scale. Uh, which is used um, as, as an original source. Uh, but essentially, at the end of that process, what the users then do is uh, submit the, um, uh, the square. Uh, so there's a couple of buttons down here. So I'm going to submit that square, uh, and it gives me, a, it clips it at the edge of those boundaries, uh, and then I confirm, uh, and, uh, and I'm in, uh, I've submitted that square for that, that kilometer square. Um, there's also a button for no parts if there are uh, no parts on, on the actual square. Um, and that's essentially the, 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 the rest of the process. Um, I'm just going to go back in and show a couple of other things, uh, explain a couple of other things. Uh, there was a second option on that start screen, which was to search on map. Um, and this allows a user to select a specific location if they're particularly interested in, um, in, in reviewing a, a kind of an area of their choice. Uh, and there's a, an option to uh, find their own location there, uh, but there's also um, this window where I'm currently speaking from in Bristol. Um, and there's also an option here for searching a location by a name. So we've got a gazetteer built in here, and you'll see as I type in uh, the name of a place, uh, it allows me to zoom to that. Um, so I've taken us up to Barnard Castle up in the north. Um, you might see some of these squares are, uh, are grid out. Um, don't worry, that's not your eyes playing tricks on you and there's no need to adjust your monitor. Um, the purpose of these was every single square is reviewed twice and uh, some of the grayed out have already been reviewed and therefore I'm constrained to selecting the squares uh, that, that, that remain. Um, the platform as I'm demonstrating it here was actually sort of a snapshot of the data about halfway through the program. So this phase of it has now completed. So the entire country at this stage is essentially gray. So every single square has already been reviewed twice. Um, and that takes us on to the sort of next stage of the project, which is called the verification stage. And this is essentially where you have a third person who is uh, reviewing the squares that uh, are um, available uh, or that, or that have, have already been reviewed. Um, and it allows them to, uh, to to review those and confirm which ones are um, you know, which paths should be um, taken forward uh, through to the next process. So, um, for some reason, I'm selecting that verify link, but it's uh, not quite going to where I'm expecting to. Um, so, I'm just going to try uh, back to identify uh, the square that I was looking at earlier. So. Um, so that link that verifies would either give me a random square or again let me search a particular area. So normally you wouldn't be able to verify your own submissions, it would be an independent third party. Um, what you see here is, is the, the, the first map um, where I did the digitizing and I've got a way of, down this list of, of highlighting the paths um, and accepting them um, or rejecting them. Uh, so I can go down this list and choose which ones. Um, I might want to uh, reject, so I'm going to reject that mistake that I intentionally digitized up there uh, and uh, approve a few others. Now in this particular instance, I think I've already, so this is um, path number six, I'd already approved the path from the first submitter, so I'm actually going to reject that one and say that that is uh, a duplicative enough. Um, and I complete that process as a verifier, I can also add other paths in myself if I think the first two reviewers have missed something. Uh, and, uh, and, and complete that verification process. Uh, I've actually got to go through all of those paths to accept or reject them explicitly. 
So I think that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, back to uh, Matt now, and he's going to tell us a little bit about the technology under the bonnet and how we built it. Thanks, Dan. Can you uh, flip me on? Brilliant. That's great. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt Walker from from Aston Technology, um, and was a uh, and one of the, the developers working on the geospatial side. Um, firstly, just the general principles that we're working to, I mean, we wanted to provide a really nice user experience. It's a crowdsourcing um, project, so we wanted to make the whole experience uh, a pleasant one to encourage people to um, come back and, um, and use the site more to contribute to more data. Um, and we also wanted to make sure it was reliable, so able to handle um, potentially spikes in load when there was um, a particular media uh, push, that sort of thing. Um, so we might only have a relatively small number of users on the site ordinarily, um, but if we had an article in, in the paper or um, social media posts that got popular, then we could potentially have a large number of users in a very short period of time. So we, we looked to try and minimise the number of moving parts so that the amount of processing that was having to be done in real time, utilise some caching, um, and then allow those other aspects that couldn't be um, minimised to... Um, to allow them to scale um, should we have uh, high demand. And we did have high demand in, in several, um, at several points during the, the initial phase. Uh, working on the project, we had uh, three agencies. So Omnify, who are a web agency, who did the front-end web developments and content management. Uh, TAP, who are more of a data um, agency, uh, provided the, uh, the web APIs and authorization. And uh, NASA and Technology ourselves, who provided all the geospatial um, aspects. So just take you through the up the one slide, take you through the, the various aspects. So right in the middle there is the, the database. So that's a, a Postgres 11 um, database actually running on Amazon um, Aurora um, with, uh, with PostGIS 2.5. Uh, so that, that contains the core project data. So things like the submissions, so the individual paths that uh, a user might draw, uh, the squares that are used to task individual users and their appropriate status. A um, whole bunch of reference data, including things like the footpath and bridle route uh, labels. Um, we, we look to move quite a bit of the application logic, basically the, the geospatial application logic, um, into the database if we could, so either using regular or materialized views for, for caching. We also make use of row-level auditing as well within the database, particularly useful for the, the verification um, phase of the the work so we can keep track of changes that a verifier may have made to an original submission. Um, down in the bottom right you'll see there's an ETL section, extract transform load, that's all about data processing so it's quite a bit of that. Um, so there we were using tools like GDAL and OGR, um, Python scripts to glue it all together and things like the um, AWS um, CLI tools for moving data um, to and from um, various services within Amazon. Um, and we use that for a whole bunch of preparation of data, so base mapping and reference data uh, prior to the project. And then um, during the, uh, the life of the project, we use it for things like calculating and caching for statistics um, and publishing data to the data warehouse separate to, to the main project for things like analysis ongoing. Jump over to the, the uh, left hand side, um, we've got um, base mapping and ve vector data. So the base mapping, that was uh, the Ordnance Survey contemporary mapping. So we've got 50k and 25k, um, all just the static tiles hosted in, um, in S3, uh, again over on, on Amazon, and the historic um, OS and BART mapping uh, provided by the National Library of Scotland. So Chris Fleet, who actually did a talk at Possible G last year uh, up in Edinburgh, um, provided access to the um, the data sets that they'd already provided, basically a set of tiles. Uh, we transform those to production national grid to fit with the rest of the project um, using map proxy um, and then hosted on S3 with um, Amazon's content distribution network, CloudFront um, in front of that and Lambda at Edge for derived from author authorization, authentication, sorry, authorization. Um, we also had some vector data over there, again, pre processed as. Um, GeoJSON vector tiles. Um, and then lastly, we had on the, the server side of things, um, some web APIs, um, which were using a talent um, service, but we uh, looked to try and use standards as much as possible to define the geography. So for instance, we used uh, GeoJSON to represent all geometry, both to and from the server, and to 
try and minimize the moving parts again we did things like the the grid that uh, users were uh, working with the grid of squares was all just rendered dynamically on the client we just had web services to just access their availability or not last but not least um, the the bit that the end user sees in the browser um, so on the geospatial side we provided a number of um, open layers uh, web maps we basically provided a library of of um, a web map so there was a grid map for the um uh, to allow the user to find a square compare maps to do the um comparison and digitizing static map for um viewing a random square and um uh, confirming before submission uh, and we basically use open layer six there um and provided this api just as uh, modern esm modules that could just be installed via um, npm by the uh, the developer and integrate nicely into to the um, the overall um, Vue.js um, base front end. So that's a very quick um, Cook's tour around the, the technology. If anyone's got any questions later, happy to, to cover them. But I'll now pass over to uh, to Jack for a wrap up. Yeah. So as Matt said, we we did get some really good media in the campaign, and, and we we launched it with quite a bit of fanfare including all of these media sources here and others which was fantastic to see and it really did resonate with the media and with the public as well which was which was fantastic um we also got quite a lot of partner organizations supporting us and getting behind the campaign which again was fantastic to see if we if you just have a look at the next slide um we had organizations such as the national trust the scouts uh, wildlife trusts british Archaeological Council um, and loads of others get on board and, and, and help promote it because it, you know, is something that really um, that really reaches out beyond just the Ramblers' core base, I think, and really resonates with people. And I think a lot of that was having a really um, use usable, um, engaging tool for people to do. It's actually something really tangible that people could do to get involved with with this. So, in terms of what actually happened uh, on the system. We had about um, we got uh, we had 154,000 squares mapped twice in just six weeks, which was really amazing to see. Um, almost 4,000 volunteers did that. Um, really good for a charity, and, and interesting to see is that over 80% of those are not currently Ramblers members. So that's you know again that reaching out beyond our current audience. And um, just to show you some of the dedication that people put in, our, our top mapper did almost 18,000 squares, um, which was just amazing in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, uh, really contributing tangibly to this, to this important area. And so, you, you know, I think we've got an image of the paths that we found, and so you can see they are all across the country in every community. Um, we need to, as Dan said earlier, we are verifying this data now. So hopefully within the next month or so, we'll be able to, um, to, to actually say how many miles of paths we've, we've lost, but I, I think it's going to be in the tens of thousands of miles um, that are missing from the map. So putting at least some of those back on that will make a massive difference to, uh, to sort of future walking and cycling generations. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, you know, as, as we've said, there's lots more to do. We're verifying the data at the moment. Um, we are also building tools for volunteers to actually go in and take a particular path and and um, help claim that path you know there's a lot in a way the identifying is very much the first step the, the real work or the big work is actually then creating the argument that a particular path should be on the map and we want to, to make tools and building on the geospatial stuff we've already built to, to make that easier and we're also doing lots of training and guidance to to get any member of the public who wants to get involved with this to support them with it um, if there's anyone on the on the call who wants to get involved or just wants to know a bit more please do go to our website um, or drop me an email um, and we'd love to get anyone involved this isn't just for ramblers members this is for the whole public and a movement of people to reclaim these these rights of way so i don't know if we've had any questions but i'm sure we're very keen to take them <laughs> great thank thanks very much jack uh, and the the rest of the team that was a very seamless three-person um, presentation which I think is the record for today so well done I think you need to stand up Jack and give us a good look at your t-shirt please oh so we got Dan now but um, yeah don't lose your way um, yeah so we've got a few questions we've got a few minutes for questions um, uh, I think uh, 
the first one, first couple maybe are for, for Jack. Uh, so somebody just wants to, uh, Tom asked if we could have a, a quick summary of what's been submitted versus what's still out unknown, i.e. how much has the project captured so far? Yeah, so, so we have done that initial stage of finding the lost rights away and that has now completed. So um, I need to look at the exact figures, but the unverified data, I think it's over 40,000 miles. Um, and we're about, I think we're about a quarter of the way through verifying that data at the moment. We're using volunteers to do that verification. Um, we're using a, basically a small subset of the original 4,000, some of those top mappers to go through that data and, and help clean it up. And we're using the same principle as before that you won't verify a square that you did originally. So again, it's a but it's a third person checking checking a square. Okay, um, thanks. And then this is a kind of practical thing. Maybe you haven't got to this yet, but issues experiences from Caitlin it says issues experiences with farmers and landowners when attempting to reopen historic public rights away. Yes. Sure, yeah. I think, I mean, you know, obviously not all landowners are going to be happy about a public right of way across their land. I suppose the thing I would say is that there's 140,000 miles them already and, you know, um, walkers and, and other people accessing the countryside bring billions to rural economy. Um, and I think it's really important to say um, that this is about recording rights that exist. You know, these are public, if we can prove something's a public right of way and it was a public right of way, these are public rights that exist, but this is about recording them and making sure that the definitive map is correct. You know, this is not about us creating something new. It's about recording something that should already exist. Cool. Okay, probably moving on to a technical one, maybe more for Matt or, or Dan. Um, did you consider using Aurora serverless to cope with and manage the scale fl fluctuations? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we did, um, but we decided the provisions was uh, was more suitable because we needed a database to to hang around and be, and be available um, twenty four seven. Um, we found that um, Aurora um, worked well for us. Um, it, it scaled a couple of times um, during uh, heavy load because provision can still scale. Um, it's just it doesn't scale down to zero when you're not not using it. Um, but because of the nature of the application, we kind of needed a database that would be about for um, for the duration. And uh, yeah, it worked out very well. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Matt. And this is a couple of questions about data and licenses. I'm, I'm going to wrap together. So Tim, who asked the last question, also says, what's going to happen to the data and on what licenses it have? Presumably that's the data collected. And the other question was from Katie, um, did, you, did the OS and LLS give you the mapping for free or did you have to pay for licenses for that? Do you want to take that one, Jack? Uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take the last one. So um, uh, the historic mapping completely free, which is fantastic. Um, the OS data we actually got a an extension of a public sector mapping agreement um, from a, uh, a government agency to um, support that because it's in the public interest, which again was fantastic to see that support from um, from them as well. Oh, in terms of chance of what's happening with the data next? The, the well. license of, of the data collected, yeah. Yeah, so I'm very happy that, that the data, you know, isn't, we, we have sort of open, open source, you know, that we do with that data. I mean, in terms of what we're doing with it, we will be, those further tools I talked about, basically we're going to, once we've um, verified it and once we've stitched together the data as well, because obviously it's all been captured in squares at the moment, so we need to create a seamless map of these rights of way. The idea is that that will be available to anyone on the, on the Don't Use Your Way site and people will be able to add to it. And then eventually, in the coming months, people will be able to then click on a path and say, I want to research this and actually start building an application around that particular path. Great. So I've just got a couple more questions I'm going to try and squeeze in. Uh, our next session is at 1.30, so obviously if people need to leave to get ready for that, fine. Um, Somebody says, Corona says, um, does this include public rights of way or is it paths other than public rights of way? So these are all public rights of way, but they're all ones that aren't recorded. So we weren't asking if there's already a right of way that's shown on um, the OS map. And that's what we're using as the sort of um, proxy for the definitive map. Um, we didn't want people to record that. So it was basically a, a spot the difference. What's missing? You know what's 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 that what's there on the old map but not shown as a right of way on the current map 
Thanks. And, and finally, uh, interesting question from James. 80% um, of the mappers were members, so what data did you collect on the volunteers and did you find any other engagement trends with these volunteers? We, we didn't collect much. Uh, we don't. We didn't collect, you know, pers like lots of detailed personal information. Obviously, with GDPR, you have to sort of justify what you're doing with that sort of stuff. Um, I think the one thing I would say, um, and this is anecdotal, is that you know we've got amazing um, uh, volunteers of the Ramblers, um, but um, you know the I think what we did with Don't Use Your Way is really broaden the what a, what a volunteer looks like in terms of in terms of getting involved with this it, you know we had people from all over the world get involved with this um you know people who had once been on a walking holiday in the lake district but wanted to go and help out with this and they now live in albuquerque new mexico you know so, you know it was really amazing just to see it was a real broad cross-section of, of of the uk but also you know international that got involved with this.